I'm here to talk today about what to do about a dog that we're keeping in a box for five or six weeks. You've made the diagnosis and you've managed the treatment, but how do you manage the recovery? How are you going to take your treatment success to completion? And you're gonna have a recovered pet at the end of that time. Well, the first thing you need to do is address the owner's concern. We all know that owners have concerns about medical health of their dog, but when we tell them that they're gonna to have to keep them inactive for four to six weeks, they look at you like you're crazy. So the first thing you need to do is change your terminology. We want the owner to buy into what we're going to do. We want them to be on board. And so instead of saying you're gonna keep your dog quiet, we're gonna emphasize that we're talking about a rest time for recovery. We need this time for your pet to recover from the treatment and so that we can have a heartworm free dog. And that changes the purpose of what they're going to do. They're part of the recovery now. We want them to be quiet but comfortable. We don't want anything to happen to your dog that's gonna make them uncomfortable, that they're gonna be upset, they're gonna bark or they're gonna whine. So our job together is to create a situation where they're quiet but comfortable. And we want them integrated into the home. Nothing that's going to sabotage your recovery more than being dogmatic, for lack of a better term, about not allowing people to interact with their pets. Why do people get pets? Why do they spend money at the veterinarians? Because of the joy they get from them. So we have to encourage them to follow our rest time for recovery, but to do it in the way that is gonna optimize that recovery. And we're gonna get them to actually comply with what we ask them to do. And we all know that compliance is really difficult. We tell them to avoid exciting stimuli. We don't want the dog to get excited, but we have to be a little bit more concrete about what that is. Is that exciting stimuli that they see out the window? Is it excited greetings when they come home? Is it not playing ball? Some are obvious and some are not. So we need for some owners to be very clear what exciting is. They might think that exciting is only not playing frisbee. So we need to make sure that they know what we're talking about when we say to avoid these exciting stimuli. But we have to address the dog's needs because the dog has needs as our patient. They don't just have medical needs, but they also have needs for exercise or some sort of activity. And we're gonna talk about what kind of exercise. They need mental stimulation. Individuals, people who are, have restricted mobility do better if they can engage in some sort of mental engagement. We're gonna talk about how to do that for dogs. They need to engage in social interaction. Dogs are very social. Dogs have co-evolved with people, and that's one of the things that makes them get along with us. So we like to be with them, and they like to be with us. And so again, we're talking about rest time for recovery. We're not talking about isolation. So how do we keep a dog calm and quiet? The best invention ever is the leash. So we encourage people to use a leash with a flat collar, a head collar, or a body harness. We certainly don't want them to use any leashes that are gonna cause pain or uh, discomfort for the dog, so we're not gonna use any choke collars or pinch collars. We're gonna give them a location where they get to rest. So we're gonna set aside a comfortable bed, and we're also gonna work at rewarding and training that dog that staying in that bed, good things happen to you. Every dog has a different size bed or type of bed that they like, and as we head into our treatment, we should be talking to the owners about establishing this rest time for recovery. What does your dog like? A big pillow bed, an LL bean bed, a bed with a back, whatever that might be. But talk about it. Don't leave it just up to them to decide. It could be a crate, and a crate is okay. A crate like this one, a plastic crate, does block out all sorts of stimuli, but it's also very isolating. So some dogs may do better in a wire crate. And that's a discussion you have to have. You can't just say, put your dog in a crate. You put them in a crate and they have their rest and they're not gonna be active for six weeks. They're not gonna listen to what you say unless you address what that means. Maybe the crate's where they are when they're away from the home because the dog's probably used to that, but the dog may not want to stay in the crate when they are home. So how are we gonna address that? We might be able to address it with see-through barriers. So if the dog is behind a baby gate next to the room where you are, then the dog might be fine. They can lay down next to that gate, they're not agitated, and we can see them and they can see us. 
If they're going to be in a room with windows, we have to ascertain whether those windows look out on things that are exciting or upsetting for the dog. But we don't want the dog to be in the dark. Because if it's in the dark, that's sort of dreary, not stimulating, and might encourage the dog to actually act out to try and get out of their confinement area. So we want to know what's outside that window. You want to know. Remember, just because they don't ask you any questions doesn't mean they know what to do. Now, it's very important that we, t we tell them what to do, or we ask them, is there a window in the room where you're planning on keeping your dog? If they say yes, what does it look out on? Oh, it looks out the front of my house. How busy is your street? Oh, people are coming and going and walking their dogs all the time. Eh. Not a good place to confine the dog. We need to cover that window, and we need to talk about how that's going to happen if that's the rest place for recovery. I encourage you to use Adapto, the, feline, the canine appeasing pheromone, that will help calm the dog so they're more accepting of their time in confinement. And finally, you can use music or white noise to help block out the things that might be upsetting to the dog. And there is an iCom, which you can program the, the sounds, and then there is through a dog's ear, which are programs that are meant and have shown to calm dogs. What about exercise? We usually think of exercise as aerobic exercise, of dogs that are herding sheep, dogs that are catching frisbees, dogs that are running around, and we all agree that th that's not our rest time for recovery. We don't have physical exercise for dogs that we're trying to keep their heart rate low. But what about mental exercise? This is my dog, Oscar, and in this video that's being ta taken today, he's 16. So you know that Oscar doesn't get around very well, and going for a walk with Oscar is, is more like two steps and sniff for 20 minutes and two steps and sniff. But he loves his puzzle toy. And you can also see that he doesn't stand too well on the slippery floor. He could have put a rug under that for him, which would have made it more comfortable for him. But he takes his time. He's not energized by it, but he's intrigued by it. And he can actually take apart that entire puzzle. He does it slower now than he did before, but he's going to work and take apart that puzzle and take out all the tiny pieces and find all the treats I'd hidden inside. And that's not a puzzle that requires the dog to be aerobically active in order to be mentally satiated. There are other ways to get mental exercise. One of the best ways is to use clicker training to teach the dog how to do new tasks. And we don't have enough time in our talk to talk about clicker training. Suffice it to say, we make the clicker associated with good things, usually food, so the dog learns that the click means your treat is forthcoming. And once they know that, we can teach all kinds of things. We can teach a chin rest, which this dog is being taught to put its chin in someone's hand so that it can be groomed. So they can groom the dog, or you can teach chin rest for ears uh, treatment and things like that. But you can also teach a dog a touch. A touch command is teaching the dog to bring their nose in proximity to your hand. And when they touch your hand, you click and treat, and they get a reward. You can teach them to click on a post-it note. So when they're in their confinement area, you can put a post-it note on the floor, and the dog's resting, and they go touch, and it touches the post-it note. And you move the post-it note over here, and you say touch, and it touches over here. Again, it's a game, but it doesn't require a lot of physical activity. You can also teach tricks, like teaching the dog to shake. So most dogs are, will offer their paw, although they won't offer it if they don't know what you want them to do. And so you may need to prompt them by touching the foot, so you put out your hand and go shake, they have no idea what you're talking about, but if you prompt them, they'll pick up their foot, you say shake, you reward them, and pretty soon you have it under verbal control and you can teach them to shake with one hand and shake with the other. You can teach them to lie down, to lie down flat on their side, head down, any number of things that are passive but active at the same time. Food dispensing toys are great. This is a little food dispensing toy that looks like a rocket ship, and it's from uh, Premier Pet Products, and you take it apart, it's like screwed in, and you can fill it with food, and then you can adjust the opening to make it more difficult or easier for the food to come out. And you can see it's not a food dispensing toy that you have to knock around in order to get the food out. So the dog can, with very little of their nose, can eat their meal, and many of these are large dogs that can eat their meals in three minutes. This prolongs eating for maybe 15 minutes. And 15 minutes is a long time, and the dog may feel very satiated once that's done. Another technique you can use is giving the dog a Kong toy and having them settle and eat their Kong toy. 
However, we know that dogs that really like Kong toys, what do they like to do with them? They like to pick them up and throw them around and bounce them around in different directions, and that's a no-no with a dog that we're resting. Well, this is a little bit different. What we've done with this Kong toy is we've taken a leash and we've cut off the clip. We've pulled it through the hole in the bottom of an empty Kong, we've tied a knot in it so it can't come out, and then we fill it with something delectable and we can put it around the leg of a chair, something that's immovable, we can spread out a sheet, we can bring out the dog, and the dog is right there enjoying the Kong and being with their people, which is something that they want. They're doing something that's fun for them, which is chewing and eating what dogs like best. Finally, what are we gonna do about social interaction? Well, we want to keep the dog nearby if possible, but of course we don't want to be moving the dog six, seven times a day because that's against our principle of limited activity. But we can use our elimination breaks to move the dog, right? We shouldn't be moving him from the backyard all the way upstairs. We have to have a plan in mind. But let's say, like many suburban households, they can go out the back porch off the kitchen, and next to that is a family room or great room. So instead of putting them back in their crate or their exercise pen, we walk them a little bit farther. We have a Kong toy that we're going to tie up, and we tether the dog as well, and we watch TV. And who knows, dogs may like Downton Abbey and they may want to be in there watching it with us. It's the final season after all. And we can use open barriers so that the dog can see us. So even if we want to keep them in a crate, maybe we need more than one. So we have a big wire crate that's big enough for the dog to stand up in, turn around, and when they sit down, their head doesn't touch the top. And if you are in an area where heartworm is endemic and you do a lot of treatments, it might be an investment for you to have big crates that you either lease to people that they can take home. Nobody wants to buy a big dog crate, they're never gonna use it again. But you can be a partner in this rest time for recovery by providing them with what they need. Finally, at the end of the day, we all have needs. We have needs that have to be met. We need privacy, we need fun, we need meaning, we need control, we need predictability, we need security, we need connection. If we help people achieve those needs for themselves and their dogs, and we provide coaching. We talk to them often and ask them, how's it going? How's the rest time for recovery do going? Oh, well, the dog's fine, but I'm really sad that I can't be with them and I don't want to sit on the kitchen floor. Then you brainstorm how to make that better. You need to be their coach and tell them they're doing a good job. Because at the end of the day, if we have happy people and happy dogs, we can celebrate that we've done a great job. Thank you very much.